So here we have Jesus, uh, not at his most popular juncture, right? Uh, Jesus goes through waxing and waning popularity depending on his audience. Uh, he has been, in human terms, kind of beating his head on the brick wall there in the temple, not literally, but against an audience that is in opposition to him. And it has now progressed from sometime in October where he was teaching in the treasury of the temple and now he is... He was caught walking, just walking along, something you expect to do unimpeded, right? You, you do not expect to be accosted in the United States of America just for walking down the sidewalk, do you? You do? You don't. I'm having trouble reading the absence of body language. No, you don't. You don't. In fact, you would consider it a, a deprivation, a privation of your constitutional rights, to not be able to walk unimpeded down a public walkway. And yet Jesus' own countrymen ganged up on him, surrounded him, and were closing in on him, and were brought to the point of desiring to stone him. Stoning is a, a, a terrible thing, by the way. The, the, the worst three ways I can think of to die at the top is drowning. I'm saying it's burning, and the stoning is a close third. <laughs> but they were to the point that they were going to stone him. Because he said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Adonai Echad, God alone, the Jew would say, is one. And Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We are unified whole. Our wills are completely coincident, one on top of the other. They overlap perfectly. What I do, the Father wants done. What the Father wants done, I do. We have that intimate of a relationship between the two of us, and they picked up stones to stone him. Let's begin here. Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Which of them are you stoning me? Now you have to, rem you have to remember, they were not, this was not lawful. The, the, the subjugated peoples of the Roman Empire, the non-citizen peoples of the empire, they were not allowed to go around executing people just because they wanted to. Because they broke some local law. The Romans did not allow, in fact, the penalty was quite stiff to go around executing people. They had a governor, in fact, in Judea's time, a guy you might know the name of, right, Pontius Pilate. Presumably they found a ring that belonged to him fairly recently, historical character. And despite, you know, sometimes you get this wishy-washy feel around this time of year when you're looking at the the trial of Jesus and Paul, I mean, Pilate goes back, not Paul, Paul was Sunday school. Pilate is now. And Pilate goes back and forth and takes a survey. It's almost like he read a church growth book somewhere. He takes a survey and he wants to know what people think and how they feel. But truthfully, Pilate was a very strict governor, generally. That was his reputation. And so they, they were risking quite a lot to pick up stones to stone a person right in the middle of Jerusalem, right in the temple compound. They were not going to get away with, with anything. That's so how seriously they, they took it. And in their minds, they would have said something that you may have heard in a different context. Because they're not the only people that would object to saying that God has a son. There's a, a, a substantial, nearly perhaps overwhelming, monotheistic, pagan religion. Well, it can't be monotheistic and pagan. Monotheistic and heathen. Pagan means multi, right? Who will say this, that Allah is no father and he has no son. That's the position they were putting themselves in by objecting to the fact that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I am the Father's Son. They would object and say, he has no son, no individual that is his son, like this. 
Jesus wants them to clarify their reasons. That's why he says, I did a lot of good things. Ergon, I just, a lot of my activities were good. All of them were from the Father. Which ones are you stoning me for? No good deed goes unpunished, yes? Everything I've done is good. Nothing, there was not even a sinful taint. There was not a hint of a sinful and wrong, prideful, selfish motivation in anything that I did. Can you say that about any one thing that you have done? I find people are not very introspective on this point. They believe that at one time there was one good work that they did that was entirely for the proper, clear, perfect, innocent motivation of helping another person or giving glory to God. I'm not sure that's possible while we are in the flesh. But Jesus says, I have done it. And not only have I done it once, I've done it over and over. I've shown you a lot of good works from the Father. He wants them to state their reasons. You have the, in this country, we have the right to face our accuser, yes? And they have to make an accusation. You just don't get to say, I'm, there's the meanie hat, or as my brother would say. There's the meanie that's accusing me of things. They actually have to speak the words. They have to say, this is what I am accusing you of. And if it's a wrong accusation, it is slander, right? Yes? That's definitive. So he wants them to speak. If you're going to, to accuse me of slander, which they do in a minute, <laughs> then speak the words. I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him. Remember, that's the code word there. Not referring to all of the Jews, specifically the Jews that oppose him, do not believe in him. So the Jews respond to him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. You can do all the good stuff that you did, Jesus. No problem. Now, I think that was a little disingenuous, actually. It's a deflection. But that's what they're saying. It's not for the good and beautiful, good works, things that you did, Jesus. You can do those all day long. But this I and the Father are one business that you cannot do. And it is for that that we are going to stone you. Blasphemy. Everybody had blasphemy in their Bible? Is that how they, they translate it? I will put finger quotes because I'm cool. Bla translate. They didn't translate it. They transliterated it. They punted. Because they wanted to make it separate from the sin of slandering somebody. And that's what it means to slander. Blasphemia, blasphemy. They just transliterated it like they did with baptism and a couple other words. Because they didn't really want to interpret it. They wanted to elevate it and say that this is something you do against God. And God only holds it against people for saying this thing. He's saying this is plain vanilla slander that you have committed against God. Plain vanilla. It would be something, you know, like saying, Josh, you're a Yankee. Right? Totally misrepresenting my personality, my heritage. Right? That's what they're accusing him of, misrepresenting his heritage, his ancestry, his origin. It's just plain old slander. It's for slander that we're doing that. I'm giving you evidence of many good things, but they accuse him of slander, and we're stoning you for it. You're claiming to be God. Now, you guys probably don't ask questions like this while you're sitting in your office, but I do. Because there, there's a fairly long list of things in our culture that you can, well, actually there's not. Fairly long list under the Mosaic Law that you could be stoned for. There's relatively few things in our codified system of laws that you can be executed for all that have to do with taking human life. That was not the case under the Mosaic Law. But I asked, now, is, it, is, is claiming to be God actually against the Mosaic Law? Now, just think, go back to walking along the sidewalk unimpeded. Can you do that for a minute? Mentally, walk with me here on this exercise, no pun intended. 
And you're walking unimpeded downtown El Paso and you see a guy with a sandwich board on and he says, I am God. Has he broken a law? Does he need medication? Probably. Yeah. Has Jesus, I, so I ask myself, is, is Jesus breaking a law? I mean, he's telling the truth. Yes, we know that. But even if they presume that he's not telling the truth, can they accuse him and convict him of breaking a law? And if they were doing that, why wouldn't they actually get a tribunal together and try him rather than stoning him in the temple? Because that, that, was, that was just not appropriate. I mean, by any estimation. You know what I found? There's a law about who you are supposed to worship. First command. You shall have no other gods before me. But you're going to look for a long time to find it explicitly stated that it's against the Mosaic law to claim to be God. There are people that tried to usurp God's position, Lucifer. There are people who worshiped other things as God, but the law has to do with who you worship, not who you claim to be. They would have said the same thing. Somebody claimed to be God. In fact, they said this about Jesus. You're nuts. You need medication. You need therapy, counseling. You don't need to be executed. Now, I was wrong once, so maybe you'll find one. You all are biblical scholars. Maybe you'll find one, but I didn't find one. But his accusers, that's got to be against the law, doesn't it? And we say this a lot too, right? There ought to be a law. There ought to be a law. Most of the time you're wrong when you say that, by the way. There ought to be a law. I mean, there ought to be a law against people with scary-looking machine guns. Why don't we just make murder illegal, right? That worked out for us. There ought not to be a law in most cases. There's got to be a law. See, if somebody goes around claiming to be God, does that have to do with who they're worshiping? No. They expect to be worshipped. And that was what offended them, the Jews. Jesus was telling them, I and the Father are unified. We have an intimate relationship. Our wills are entirely overlapping perfectly. What the Father wants done, I do. What I do is what the Father wants done. All of this comes together, and what you owe the Father, you owe me. Whoa, 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 Skippy. You're just a man. I can see you. You've got flesh and bones. I can pick up your genealogy from the closet in the temple. That's what offended them. It wasn't for the good works. It was for slander. It wasn't illegal. It helps us understand Jesus' answer. Stick with me. This is... Jesus' answer seems out of place if he's not answering whether it's illegal or not. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Now get what Jesus is saying. He's quoting from the Psalms, not actually from the law, right? Psalm 82. 82? Yes. Jacob, did you read Psalm 82? You did. Sometimes we get confused. I read all the things that are on the list. Psalm 82 is God calling judges and rulers of the people to judge righteously. And it is Yahweh himself speaking. When Jesus quotes this, Jesus answers them, has it not been written in your law, I said, you are God. And if he called them gods, if God called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. What Jesus is saying is that the law, Yahweh himself recognized in the Old Testament that when you are a God's appointed ruler, ruling over God's appointed people with God's word, 
You're in, in effect an agent of God. You bear his title. Now in Psalm 82, God clarifies that and says, don't get any ideas. You're still going to die. But while you're alive, you are God's, doing God's work. from their own scripture, the one that they were using to try to justify stoning him. You could legitimately call them that because of the authority that was delegated to them. And he says, scripture cannot be broken. This is in the Bible. This is what it says. You, you can look it up if you want. Probably footnoted there for you. And if you called them gods, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. You say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. Now Jesus is arguing from the lesser to the greater. If God can say that with entire truth and validity of these human judges, these magistrates and rulers over the people in the Old Testament, it is at the very least not slander for me to say that while I am sitting here in the temple preaching and teaching the word of God to you. So step back and put the stones down. It's called an a fortiori argument, from the lesser to the greater, or from the greater to the lesser. It goes both ways. And if Yahweh does that, if Yahweh himself calls those rulers and magistrates and judges gods in that sense, who had done none of the things that Jesus had done, are we clear about that? Jesus was entirely unique in a huge number of the signs and the miracles that he had done. Then it's at least as legitimate as that for him to say, I am the Son of God. I and the Father are one. If the lesser is true, the greater is more true. He had been sanctified. And you Bible students should perk your ears up there. What does sanctified mean? What, what's your, I'll give you my hillbilly definition in a minute. What's your definition of sanctified? I'm sorry? I can't hear y'all. Y'all need a microphone. To be made holy. That's interesting. That's like defining the word with the word. Hmm. What does being holy mean? What, Tara? You don't know. Tony, no. Anna, no. Tony's, I mean, uh, you know, everybody's smiling real big and always got an answer. It means set apart, right? It doesn't mean specifically being made holy as being made more righteous because that was not something Jesus needed. It's not something that Jesus sought. He's God the Son, eternally preexistent with the Father, right? So it's actually, we're jumping over a step when we say that being sanctified is to be made more righteous or more holy, when Jesus says that God sanctified the Son, it means that he set him apart for a purpose. Gave him a job to do, a ministry to do. That may help us understand what it means to be sanctified ourselves in this life. Recognizing that God has given us something to do. And the Father sent him into the world. So he has a personal commission from God, not a general commission he was sanctified personally by God the Father to do this job and sent into the world. Now, understand what is happening there because all over the world you are required to make pilgrimages if you are part of certain world religions, right? Y'all didn't know that? Did you know that people, you know, people going to holy places all over the world? In fact, here in El Paso, once a year, people crawl up backwards on their knees barefoot. Mount Crystal Ray, I think. Right? It's a holy place, they say. I've never been up there. I consider every ground I stand on to be holy ground. Boots or not. Jesus is saying this. You didn't have to come find the Savior. The Savior came and found you. The Father sent him. The Son came to you. You do not have to find him. You don't have to go to certain GPS coordinates to be in his presence. He came to the earth. And Jesus is pointing out to them, regardless 
of whether you believe that I am the big S, Son of God, whether you believe all of this stuff about me, it is certainly not blasphemy for me to say this. So put the stones down. Then he gives them a simple formula. You like formulas? Everybody asks me for a formula. Premarital counseling? Give me five bullet point principles so that my marriage will be easy, fruitful, and lovely. And wonderful. I've been married for 19 years. If you have those points, give them to me. Because I have the best wife in the world who is married to an old goat of a man sometimes. We could use them. They want everything down into a formula. Not, can I say this? I say this all the time probably, but not everything fits on a bumper sticker, folks. Not everything is a bullet point. If you don't understand some words, you're going to have to learn some words. If you haven't read enough of the Bible, you need to read more of the Bible. If you don't remember enough of the Bible, you need to read more of the Bible. If you don't apply enough of the Bible, read more of the Bible. That's important. Because nobody can digest it for you in a way that you are going to apply it properly all the time. But Jesus does have a formula for this. Verse 37 says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. In other words, if you can find fault with one single thing that I did, one single sign, one single miracle, if you can blame bringing the dead to life on anybody else other than Yahweh, the personal God of Israel, if you can find one fault, then kick me to the curb. Not something you're going to find a pastor saying. Not something you're going to find a good teacher saying, or a rabbi. If you can find one fault in a decision or an action that I have made, then kick me to the curb. That's pretty transparent, isn't it? Authentic, we say. Pretty authentic. And he meant it. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works. Now, what does that mean? See, there's pretty good, we have pretty good evidence that Jesus in most of his 12 had a discernible accent. Right? Some people would say, I have a discernible accent. I don't know if I do or not. Do I? You know where I'm from? You don't, do you? You have a discernible accent from Galilee. They knew where they were from. As soon as they opened their mouth, you're from Galilee. It's like people from Philadelphia. You know, you always see on the TV shows, they can tell not only that they're from Philly, but what block they're from on Philadelphia. Very, very discernible, very knowable. He wasn't all that educated. He was a blue-collar worker. I know exactly what Jesus did for a living because I grew up making sawdust myself. Let me tell you, when you walk into a room full of PhDs, and I do this on occasion, and you say, I can build a whole dining set by hand if I need to. There you go. Wow. The next thing is, tell me something I care about. I mean, they're impressed moderately because most of them, can y'all do that? Like from the firewood, chop the tree down and make the whole table? Yeah. No. But it's not relevant. So when Jesus is standing before all of these religious authorities, the Jews and these people in the temple, you know, he's saying, "If if my accent is a problem for you, if my resume is a problem for you, if my lack of education is a problem for you, Don't let it be a problem. Look at the works that I have done. I'm a Galilean carpenter by trade, he said. If you have a problem with that, look at the works. But but however you believe, believe in me. Believe the works so that you may know and understand, know and keep knowing that the Father is in me and I in the Father. I in the Father 
are one. If you can't believe the words that I speak, believe the works that I do. I don't think it worked. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. He slipped out of their hand, it says, literally. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. I think John includes that. So that we are unable to question the nature of the formula that Jesus gave. If I don't do the works, don't believe in me. But if I do the works, though you have some personal problem with me, believe the works that I do so that you can be brought to this knowledge of the unity between the God the Father and God the Son because all he changed was his location all he changed was his audience he left Jerusalem he left the temple went across the Jordan where John had been baptizing and what is not great water for baptizing by our standards from what I understand And it doesn't say that he did many, many, many works staying there. And many believed in him. Back in Jerusalem, their reaction was, I guess, kind of predictable. It reminds me of of the joke. Jacob told the joke. I guess I can... Tell a joke. Y'all may just consider me one big joke. It's okay. It's not really much of a joke, you know, but it floats around here and there. It says, guys, if a woman is mad at you, just tell her that she's overreacting. And she'll realize you're right and calm right down. <laughs> Isn't that the way that works? I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> Well, okay, let me step in it further. You might be right. She may be overriding. She may need to calm down. But what are you going to expect as a reaction? Big long word, exacerbation. You're going to expect the overreacting to get more overreacting, right? That's what they did. Jesus said, this isn't against the law. You guys need to stop. Here's the formula. Believe in me. You can because many people have. If you get the personality problems out of it, you will believe. But instead, they overreacted more, <laughs> trying to seize him. Many believed. It wasn't that hard, folks. You know, there's a guy once with doctor in front of his name, wrote a book called Hard to Believe. I read it a long time ago. I probably chunked it. It's not hard to believe. Not when Jesus is do, speaking in front of you and doing the works in front of you, signs and miracles in front of you. It's not hard. By definition, it's supposed to substitute for the hard things that Jesus... I mean, Jesus did the hard things. He just asked us to believe in him and to tell people about him. Right? So many believed in him across from the Jordan. We need to be prepared for that. You know, I find... I find Christians are more surprised. You know, in America especially, Christians are more surprised when people believe in Jesus than when they reject. Have you noticed that? Over over the years that I've been in pastoral ministry, I have had more people be entirely confused by the fact that somebody received the gospel before they were finished giving it. That's not the first time that's happened. You can read Acts when Peter's preaching his message and the Holy Spirit interrupts. Stops him cold. You need to believe. It's not hard to believe. Believing is the alternative to the hard thing. 
But when you run into people who repeatedly refuse, you can present to them the formula. You have a personality problem with Jesus. <laughs> Look at the works. And there's various apologetic approaches you can take. You can say that, that uh, what was it, Chuck Colson said, I know that the resurrection is true. I'm going to paraphrase here because I can't remember the entire quote. I know the resurrection is true because I know uh, that 12 men wouldn't die <laughs> for a lie like that. We, we, we broke them in a few minutes. He says over Watergate. Various apologetic approaches. You can give them the formula, but be prepared to move on. Jesus did that. The creator of the universe moved across the Jordan from Jerusalem when people refused to believe. That is a hard decision to make sometimes. Because y'all love people, don't you? Don't say no. You love people, right? I love people. I know some of you cranky old guys are going to say no. It's okay. I'm turning into a cranky old guy. I'm trying to stop it. I got there early. You love people. But you've got to make the decision sometime. We have to make it as a church sometime. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day.